Welcome, fight fans, to the hardest-hitting half hour in combat sports. You are watching Five Rounds. He is Robin Black. I am John Ramdeen. And the Revel Nightclub was the site of World Series of Fighting 2. In the main event, Andre Orlovsky battled former UFC welterweight Anthony <laughs> Rumble Johnson. And Anthony Johnson proving that I think uh, heavyweight suits him very well as he hurt Andre Orlovsky very, very badly, uh, broke his jaw, but they delivered uh, a pretty entertaining fight back and forth. The fight didn't go to the ground, and Anthony Johnson jacked up, uh, did some damage. Yeah, I enjoyed this fight, and I think this is what we're looking for from World Series of Fighting right now. It's just enjoyable matchups. Fights with great athletes against great athletes. And I thought that Anthony Johnson, what I found interesting was how well he did at heavyweight, but at the same time, he's not a heavyweight. So you could see him taking those shots. He would land more than he took, but when he took them, he felt them. He started to pursue the takedown. Later in round two and round three, the commentators and his coaches were demanding that he stand in the pocket, but they're not the ones getting drilled by Andre Arlovsky. I wouldn't want to be hit by that guy, oh, would you? Man, no, come on. That's a 240-something-odd former heavyweight champion. And when you're standing in there, really, he's a 185er or a 205er. Yeah, he looked big, but his structure isn't built for that type of abuse. Came through in an exciting fight. Uh, there's some problems leading into the World Series of Fighting, their second event. Uh, people were concerned whether this show would happen or not, and it did happen, thank God. I mean, everything went off without a hitch and we know the main event everybody knows their names Arlovsky yeah. Anthony Johnson people saw their brand built being in the UFC but there's some guys on the undercard I think that delivered uh, guys like Rick Glenn and uh, who else was Marlon, on? Marlon Moraes yeah. in the co-main event taking out uh, Tyson Nam who took out former Bellator champion Eduardo Dantes and I think that should be the model moving forward for the World Series of Fighting. Yes, it's important to bring in outside guys, but I think they should focus on building their fighters internally, put them on, make sure that they entertain the crowd. And when you have a couple of young guys like Glenn and Moraes, Come on, it only makes sense. This is where some of the pro, uh, some of the conversation changes from talking about fighting to talking about business, and this is where some of the problems arise. In the world right now, the UFC cornered all the fighters that we know their names, and if we they don't have them, if they don't have you know every fighter whose name you know, there's guys like Paulo Filo out there. You know, and Paulo Filo was once a great athlete, bit of a basket case, had some mental issues and substance some abuse. substance abuse problems. So you end up with guys like him because you want recognized names. On the other hand, you have these great athletes like Rick Glenn, who looked fantastic in this fight. I got to call his last couple of fights before the World Series of Fighting. The kid is a stud. And Marlon Moraes just moved beautifully on the feet, looked fantastic. But guys like that will, you know, want to move on to the UFC. And Bellator has the rest of them. So it's going to be very, very difficult for this organization to move forward when you've got Bellator and the UFC. Well, the there. World Series of Fighting definitely has to hold on to these young guys. because We mentioned Glenn and Moraes, both both of these guys, 24 years of age, and all you have to do is look at the backstory to be able to tell the story moving forward. Moraes beat a former WEC champion, and he beat a guy who beat the former Bellator champion. And right there, people have interest. There's You create interest for people to want to see these Sorry athletes. Sorry to interrupt, John, but hello. It, this is the UFC yeah. calling. Hey, Rick Glenn, I thought you looked fantastic in that last fight. Would you like to fight in the UFC? We'll, we'll get you national television exposure. You'll get a lot more money for your sponsorship and you'll you'll make your dreams come true come on over uh, yes and, and I agree hundred percent but this is also a sport that involves loyalty and all you have to do is sell it to these guys say look we're gonna do our best to put you put your face as the face of our company and will you do the same will you be loyal will you stay with us through thick and thin uh, until we you know yeah that's, blow all, that's our money? all great in theory man kumbaya let's hold hands and, and dance together and stuff but the reality is you got kids to feed you got a gym you got to pay for you got all this kind of stuff and the dream is to get in the UFC and if you're not at that level Bellator is finding the best young athletes out there it's gonna be tough an organization like this generally starts because some really rich guy knows somebody who knows a little bit about MMA and they decide to invest all their money, ultimately they usually lose it. But what about a guy like Marlon Moraes? You know, he goes to the UFC, signs an 8-8 eight and eight contract or a 10-10 and 10 contract. You're now fighting killers for 10-10 and 10, where he could stay with the World Series of Fighting and possibly make the same amount of money. Don't change the channel. When we come back, one of the greatest Canadian mixed martial arts fighters ever.
Welcome back to Five Rounds, and joining us is a Canadian mixed martial arts icon, Mr. Mark Hominick. Mark, thanks so much for joining us, and we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, we want to talk about a fight uh, in the division that you were at the top of, 145 pounds. It takes place August 3rd in Brazil, Jose Aldo taking on Anthony Pettis, and Pettis doing the unthinkable after coming off that big victory over Donald Cerrone. Instead of saying, you know what, I want to challenge for 140, 155, which he does want to do that, he decides to go down to 145 pounds to take on one of the the best fighters, one of the pound for pound kings of the sport right now in Jose Aldo. Uh, do you like this move? I think it's a smart move. You know, he's had his hands tied. He's been waiting for this title shot at 55 and, you know, the rematch has, has sidelined him a bit and yeah, let's take that title shot. What about you? Well, you know, when I was talking to Duke Rufus and he was saying that at 155, when guys fight, they get injured. There's all kinds of variables. You know, we could see Henderson fight this next fight, get injured, be out for six or seven months. He looked at it. He's like, all those ready right now. Pettis can definitely make the way. Let's do it. Uh, Anthony Pettis has proven to be one of the most creative fighters in mixed martial arts right now. Uh, uh, he can seem. He seems to be able to do it all. Whether it's the standing game, uh, the jiu-jitsu game, has had some problems with wrestlers in the past. Uh, what should he do to try to fix those holes? You know, I think this is just two of the most dynamic strikers in the game. I think they're the two best kickers in all of the sport. And you know, we're going to see if he can deal with the leg kicks from Aldo. But I think when he switches his stance, it's going to eliminate a lot of Aldo's leg kicks. Uh, Jose Aldo, of course, uh, pe people just don't know what this guy has. I mean, he's got so many skills, and people say, well, you know, when he gets on the ground. Uh, He's very skilled. You were able to take him down on the ground. Sure. What were some of the things that you felt with uh, Jose on his back? You know, it was after a five-round battle. We went. We, everyone says, oh, just take him down. Right. But again, that's after four rounds of battle. I hit him in the body and then got the takedown in the final round. And again, I just don't, don't th uh, see Pettis going for a takedown. He, he, you know, he's never shown really offensive wrestling, mm. and he's comfortable on his back. I could see, if anything, Aldo taking him to the mat and you know, him playing the guard game. Yeah, and I think that maybe plays into the kickboxing game as well, because if Pettis isn't convincing with his selling of the takedowns, mm. all of a sudden Aldo can throw that right out the window and just commit to his kickboxing game. One thing that I think we noticed in that last fight with Cerrone is Pettis' hands were really, really crisp. He looked extremely extremely, extremely good in close in that boxing range and that's a place maybe he can take Aldo. Uh, I know a lot of people say that it's mixed martial arts and that uh, you know you can't neglect any area of the game which you can't. I mean we saw Carlos Condit uh, lose to Johnny Hendricks because his wrestling just wasn't up to par. Uh, but with this matchup you have a guy who's coming from a kickboxing background. Duke Rufus obviously one of the best uh, striking coaches in mixed martial arts right now. Is it, is it important to have a base in mixed martial arts? For sure. I, mean, I think you know you're gonna be get more finishes if if you come from a striking background because you see a lot of the fighters now you know they're, they're complete MMA fighters yeah. but they're not dominant in one area so you're not gonna see a lot of finishes you know with, with Pettis he has the ability to, to you know KO a guy with one kick he's just he's got a dynamic kick and that can finish bouts but again with he has Ben Askren helping with his wrestling at Duke Rufus and that's that's a huge asset to have what a coach with Ben, ben Askren. Yeah, then that, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. It's also having the team around you. Uh, of course, we know that he has skills, and uh, number, he also wants to be a role model for his younger brother, who's yeah. doing very well as, uh, in mixed martial arts right now. But yes, you talk about the wrestling background, and I think a lot of these guys, they work on their grappling skills or their mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu skills just so that they can, you know, not survive. I guess it is survive, for lack of a better word, uh, in the certain realm to be able to get back up and to showcase the skills, because that's what Anthony Pettis wants to do. He wants to entertain. That's why He's got the tattoo showtime on his back. He knows that's the way to make money. And quite frankly, that is the way to make money because the casual fan right now, they aren't that interested in seeing a ground game. They're not really interested in seeing a lot of scrambles. They want to see two guys delivering kicks and punches until somebody falls. Yeah, but at the same time, everything plays into it. I think one really interesting aspect of this is the wrestling if it goes there. Because uh, the Andre Pedaneras guys, the guys from, um, Novo from the uh, Novo Now, they have that really am uh, amazing takedown offense on that single. They just kind of hit your face across a limp leg and get away. So if we see Pettis even attempt that single and he gets rejected early by uh, Aldo, Aldo will be able to open up a lot more with the kicks. Yeah, for sure. Now, if anything, I think it's going to be Pettis. You know, we've seen against the fight with Clay Guida. He was too comfortable to be on his back because, mm -hmm. you know, he always goes for sweeps and triangles and arm, arm locks from, from the bottom. And he, he, he lost the belt because of that. So if Aldo takes it to the mat, I, I think, he, you know, he'll play the guard game. He won't try and get back to his feet because you've seen that's how he got the loss against Clay Guida. Uh, will he be able 
able to sweep Aldo if uh, Aldo is on top on the ground? I, I really don't think so. I think all you know the the, the level that they have down there at, at you know, the camp in Novinial in Brazil is just is dynamic and they're so amazing like grappling. I just don't see him getting submitted. You, you know, we see a lot of guys at this level where they have to improve. You know, say Marquardt loses to leg kicks, he comes back and he's kicking in the next fight. And I think with Pettis, you know, working with with Ben Askren, he will now have changed that. I've even seen a few interviews where he talked about it, where when he's taken down now, the game will be definitely to be yeah. to get back up. But with these things kind of cancel each other out, I think we're going to see a kickboxing match, and I think that's what we all want to see. And of course, uh, you know, champion. it's difficult the what they say. It's more difficult to stay a champion than to become a champion. Everybody's trying to chase you. Uh, you were a champion in the past. Uh, Jose Aldo uh, fighting in Brazil, so a lot of pressure on this guy. Yeah. Uh, will that, uh, can that affect well, the game? Well, I, I was in Brazil uh, when Sam Stout fought there, and the atmosphere there is something else. And, you know, you see a different kind of passion come out of the Brazilian fighters fighting in their homeland. And that, I, you know, it is crazy, the atmosphere there, how loud the crowd is and how much intensity they bring to the cage. But, you know, let's think about that for a second, too. Pettis has gone five rounds yeah. before in the past against Henderson. So once you get, you know, when you fought Aldo, Aldo seemed to slow down in four yeah. and five. Now, your pace is crazy, but, you know, if Pettis is looking for that as well, and Aldo's a little too wound up early yeah. because of that crowd, the extra from the crowd, that can favor Pettis late in the fight, for right? For sure. That that has been a knock on Aldo is his conditioning. He, you know, even slowed down in his last fight against Frankie Edgar yeah. as well. So, um, you know, I just don't see it going the, the five rounds. I think they're so dynamic. It could be a knee, it could be a kick from either guy it's just like it's almost like a toss-up fight to me and what about the wrestling background or the wrestling abilities of Jose Aldo we know that he brought in uh, Gray Maynard to yep. help him work on those skills and we saw it in the Chad Mendez fight uh, of course it didn't go that long yep. so uh, we couldn't see exactly what Jose Aldo is capable of but just to see that a guy continues to improve at such a rapid rate uh, uh, I mean you, you face the guy you know how skilled he is uh, is he a guy that can hold this title for a long time. No question. I actually, I, after this fight, I, I could see him going to 155 because then it'll be two guys that that were champion or, or fought for the belt at 155 and, and beat them both if, if he gets past Pettis. So I could see him going to 55. He's, that talk's been going around for a long time, and I don't think there's too many more fights. I think it, you know he's more into the fight business as well. You know he wants big fights, big money fights, and they're at 55. Yeah. And does that make does that make sense to you? Uh, from a, I mean, you've been in the business. Uh, you're a fan of the sport. Yeah. Would you rather see guys taking the biggest fights, the most exciting fights, opposed to just kind of climbing the ranks? I, I would rather. I mean, you're in the fight business. You're an entertainer, and you want to put on entertaining fights. And that, those are the kinds of guys that are going to get rewarded by the UFC. Well, one guy that definitely entertains is Chael Sonnen. He's going to be taking on John Jones for the 205 pound championship of the world, and Chael. Sonnen has done such a phenomenal job of selling his whole persona, uh, but I mean, w when you look on paper, it doesn't seem like Jones and Sonnen match up that well at all. It seems that Sonnen is very good at talking and wrestling, of course, but John Jones, uh, he seems to be able to download all this martial arts information in such a short period of time. and utilize it in the cage, which is, to me, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, he epitomized what a champion is. He yeah. comes back with new tools and new assets every single fight. And it, it's, it's, it's impressive to see someone at that level improve that much yeah. each fight. Like, he, he is hungry every time. You know, we're not just talking about the mind games aspect and the mental aspect because it's Sonnen. It, we're talking about it because it's relevant. One, it's one of the only ways that Sonnen can kind of equal the deck. He's a smaller guy. He has less tools at his disposal. But we saw when uh, Nick Diaz was getting under the skin of George St. Pierre, it matters. He had him rattled. And Sonnen is very much of a mental dude. If he's on his game mentally, like he was in the first Anderson Silva fight, and he gets under Jones' skin, he can possibly win this fight. If he's off his game like he was in the second Anderson Silva fight, and he doesn't succeed at, at rattling Jones, he has no hope. And I, I think that that's the, uh, it's very important to have a good team around you. A guy like Greg Jackson that can say, look, this is just mental warfare. He's trying to get under your skin. He's trying to rattle you. Stay calm. Don't worry about that stuff. Just do all the preparation that you need to do. And once the cage door closes, well, then you can dance. Well, John Jones has, you know, he's had to deal with this with Rashad Evans because yeah. it was such a personal belt. And he, he went there with a flying color. So I really don't think he's going to be he shook immensely in this fight. But even when you have a coach who can help you with those aspects, <laughs> like Faraz did with George, it's still conversations you're having. When you could yeah. be talking about game plans, you could be talking about what you're going to do, getting in shape, cutting the weight, all these other things. You're having conversation after conversation 
conversation with your coach, almost kind of making it real. You know, it, it, you can't understate how much it matters. Now, I, I just want to get your take on that because this is, you know, mixed martial arts is relatively new. So I imagine when you first started training in this stuff, there wasn't talking about mental warfare in the yeah. sense that guys are kind of going the pro wrestling angle. Using television. Uh, using and television. And to, yeah. To, so now that there's this new element introduced yeah. to the game, how do you kind of teach some of the young guys that are coming up? Well, I mean, the, the fight is the most important, and especially when you're coming up in the smaller levels, that, that, that should be the focus. But again, when you're fighting in main, main event type status, you, you have to make some you know, key headlines that, that draw attention to the fight because you're in the fight business. Again, you're trying to sell pay-per-views, you're trying to sell yourself, trying to market yourself, and it is part of the game, especially when you're at the higher level. And the UFC, we know they're, they're going to sell this fight very well because they've already done a great job. Chael Sonnen mainly yeah. is the guy that's selling this fight. But on paper, uh, you look at some of the guys at Chael Sonnen, we, we know he has a wrestling background. He's been able to dominate, for the most part, uh, Nate Marquardt and Yushin Okami and all these guys that don't have wrestling backgrounds. Uh, Michael Bisping, who doesn't have a wrestling background uh, either, he was able to kind of neutralize Chael Sonnen. He, was, he actually took him down in that fight. So I think that uh, Chael Sonnen's going to have a very difficult time dealing with John Jones because he went through that system. He was a wrestler. Yeah, he was a junior national champion in wrestling. Exactly. And, and again, he's fought uh, Ryan Bader and, yes. and all those guys, and, and he submitted him. And I think that I think that's the way the fight is going to end with, with John Jones. I think he's in close submission. Well, like like Mark alluded to too about guys really having a base. There is a big difference between some young guy who's developing all the skills, who doesn't really ever, never really became a full level wrestler. Just takes guys down, puts them against the cage, has two or three takedowns and two or three variables. But Sonnen can come in there with a wrestling game that can make Jones work. And if Jones either spends tons of time on preparing for that, he can maybe you know, uh, not spend as much time as he may on some of the other areas, or if he doesn't spend enough time on it, he will get put on his back. Uh, the problem is it's going to be five rounds, and yes, uh, John, uh, Chael Sonnen might be able to get one or two takedowns, but I have a feeling John Jones is going to be able to get back up and make him pay for getting those takedowns. It's going to be a great fight no yeah. matter how you uh, And your thoughts? You know, I, I just, like, John always improves, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him pull off a triangle or an armbar or a sweep, just because you can see every fight he mm -hmm. improves, and again, he knows he's going to be on his back at some point in this belt. So he's going to be working, working all those angles. Don't change that channel. More from five rounds when we return, including our talk about the 205-pound matchup between Musasi and Gustafsson. Welcome back to Five Rounds. UFC on Fuel TV 9 goes down on April 6th in Sweden. The main event, Alexander Gustafsson looks for a title shot if he gets a victory over Gegard Mousasi, a guy that's kind of been flying under the radar uh, as of late, actually through the majority of his mixed martial arts career. And Mark, I want to kind of talk about uh, the similarities yep. between Mousasi's entrance in the UFC and your entrance in the UFC. Uh, UFC 58, you were supposed yeah. to take on Eve Edwards, who at the time was the uncrowned king of yep. the 155 five pound division. Now Alexander Gustafsson is kind of that in that same yeah. position uh, with a victory. He gets the next crack at John Jones versus uh, or John Jones, Chael Sonnen. We all know it's going to be John Jones. It's going to be Chael we, Sonnen. We expect it to be John Jones. You know, anything can happen. Uh, but just talk about the pressure uh, for Gustafsson fighting in his yeah. backyard. He's got, you know, he wins this fight. Yeah. He gets the, the big prize, you know, in, in his eyesight. Yeah. And uh, that, that can mess with the fighter mentally. No, no, no question there. Like, they're putting a fight in Sweden, back to back, he's headlining again. He is a superstar there, and they've already promised him a title shot after after a win. So again, these are these are a lot of distractions that, that could take him away from you know how dangerous Musasi is. Now, is he? Is it possible that he could be overlooking Musasi, thinking, oh, you know, you know, I become the champion, yeah. my life changed changes well, dramatically. I, I think that there's a big difference between uh, experience when you're a young fighter, you have no worries, you have no cares about anything, you're going in there and you're going to beat the guy. You know, when you're older, you do have, you know, you're worrying about your career a little bit more and how the fight's going to go, how this fight's going to affect me. And I think he's, he's at that young age where he's just hungry, he wants to, he wants to go and put on a show, which he's going to do. I don't think he's going to underestimate Musashi because he's from Europe. And, oh, you know, if you're a fight fan in Europe, 
Doug, you're well aware of yeah. Gegard Mousasi. You've seen him even as a K1 kickboxer, and you've seen him develop. So I don't think he's going to underestimate him. But it is a lot of pressure. You're suddenly fighting a guy, you know, who's been fighting for 11 mm. years compared to your five and a half, who you've seen. It's his biggest fight of his career, and that's a guy. And that's saying that he's already fought Shogun, and I still think it's his biggest fight of his career. Uh, Mousasi, I mean, we know his skills. He's a great stand-up guy. He's aggressive. He goes for the finish. Uh, but for Gustafsson, is it more important that you say, let's entertain this crowd, let's go out and try to prove to everybody that I deserve that crack at the 205 pound title, or is it more important that you just go out, say, look at whatever I have to do to get the win, I've seen that Musasi has had deficiencies in the wrestling element, put this guy on his back, and if I have to stay there for five rounds, so be it. Well, I, I, I went in there when I was promised a title shot after the George Root fight. I wanted to go and make a statement. I, and I had a first round knockout. And again, I, I think they're motivated to go and show why you are the number one contender. And it's, again, being that young, you know, careless attitude, I think he's going to go out and do that. His style is exciting. So I, no matter what, what, what area he goes, it's going to be an exciting fight. I, I think, I, I mean, I think that's what we can hope for because yeah. if Gustafsson's aggressive, that's going to play. Musasi can be a counterpuncher. He can be a very good counterpuncher. And if he draws in the longer fighter and tries to land his big right hand, you know, he's going to open up a lot of opportunities. He'll make for an exciting fight. Yeah. For sure. I, I, I'm really impressed by his movement. You know, being such a tall, lanky fighter, to how, how much he's on his toes and mm -hmm. uses his reach really, very well. So I, it's going to be a great matchup. And if you're trying to formulate a game plan, if you're Musasi's coach and you're saying, okay, there are a couple of areas where we yeah. think we can exploit and get to his chin, uh, what, what is that? Pressure, you know, cutting, cutting the ring off as best he can, putting him against the cage, using his takedowns, trying to wear him out, you know, because if you, if you fight him on that distance game, he's going to lose. He's gonna and, get and that was the apart. problem with, with exactly. Shogun. Yeah. Shogun didn't do that. Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know why, because that's the type of sh exactly. fight we've seen from Shogun yeah. in the past. And, and it's just not, uh, we're not seeing the same type of style from, from yeah. the Brazilian Their, their in the styles, past. you know, play off each other because, you know, Gusin, he likes to move and be on his toes and Musasi likes to put pressure. So it's, it's a, you know, they yeah. play into each other's strengths. Yeah, the modern Musasi, the strike force, Era Musasi tucks his chin, keeps his hands up high, and just starts to hunt you towards the cage. This is going to be an exciting fight. I love it. Is this guy rushed? Is uh, Alexander Gustafsson ready to be challenging for the 205 pound title? Uh, when you see so many qualified guys underneath, is this the t right time for him, considering you have such a young, dominant champion? I, I don't. I, yeah. I don't think he's ready for, for John Jones in that I level yet. I think he's, you know, he's, he's a main event on a, on a on a free TV card, I think that's the right move. But going from there to a pay-per-view against John Jones, that is a completely different world. It is definitely a lot of pressure for Alexander Gustafson. Next week, we'll get more in-depth about this card. It's Fuel TV 9. It takes place in Sweden. For my guest, Mark Hominick, and my broadcast partner, Mr. Robin Black, we want to thank you so much for watching. I'm John Ramdeen. We'll see you next time on Five Rounds.